Good morning again. Uh, I have about a minute after 11, so we'll go ahead and get starting, uh, started for this morning's webinar. I really want to thank everyone for uh, being able to join us uh, this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, hurricanes and how we forecast them and also uh, how, we, how we track them and then take a, a period of time for your questions and hopefully provide some answers to those. Um, I will mention that uh, you know, unfortunately there were some uh, the tornadoes that affected uh, these states, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, uh, on Sunday uh, did change a little bit on who we could have on our webinars, uh, but we do have a special guest I'll introduce in just a minute. Uh, but uh, again, thank you for being able to be on. We certainly, our, our thoughts and prayers go to those folks that were affected by the tornadoes over the weekend. Uh, but today we're going to talk about hurricanes, another hazard that we have to be thinking about preparing for as we approach uh, a hurricane season. So, uh, if John, if you'll go to the next slide, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, the area that we are focused on today and introduce you to some of the hurricanes. Unfortunately, uh, this area is no stranger to hurricanes. And as you see here, we've had several hurricanes over the past uh, many decades, uh, going all the way back to 1969 with Camille. It's in that upper right-hand uh, picture. And you can see that that hurricane uh, was one of only four Category 5 hurricanes to strike the United States. And uh, more recent times, we've had hurricanes such as uh, Ivan, Rita, Katrina, and even Harvey that have affected parts of this area, bringing a dangerous storm surge, strong winds, and heavy rainfall. And we're going to talk about those various hazards here today. But let me introduce you to our panel of experts that we have on the line with us. And these folks are going to help answer your questions uh, today. There is a question box on your control panel uh, that you can start uh, typing in questions. Uh, we will try to answer some of those during the webinar, uh, but we will save a lot of the really good ones uh, for the question and answer period. And again, want lots of questions so we can provide it to our panelists here today. So our panelists include uh, Robbie Berg, he, Hurricane Specialist at the National Hurricane Center. Uh, I am uh, Dan Brown. I'm also a Hurricane Specialist at the National Hurricane Center. And like you all, uh, right now, we are working from our homes. Uh, we do have a unit at the Hurricane Center that is doing operational forecasting, uh, doing marine forecasting uh, at the center. And But right now, uh, since it's not hurricane season, we're uh, most uh, a lot like your parents and are working from home uh, while we deal with the current uh, health situation. But Robbie, I'll let you give a uh, hello. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar this morning. Um, Dan and I are going to be watching your questions in the box when you type them in, and hopefully we'll be able to answer some of them uh, towards the end of the presentation. So uh, have fun this morning. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, our uh, next person I'll introduce is uh, Danielle Manning. Danielle is from our National Weather Service Forecast Office in Slidell, uh, Louisiana. They cover southeastern Louisiana. Uh, Danielle's going to talk a little bit about what they do on the webinar. And then she's going to also stick around for questions and answers. So good morning, Danielle. Hi, thanks for having me uh, on the webinar with y'all. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to folks across our region. Thanks for joining us. I know it's been a busy time for you all uh, at your office as well this past weekend. Uh, Andy Lotto is going to join us uh, for the uh, second half of the presentation and also be around for the question and, uh, question and answer period. Andy is also a hurricane specialist at the National Hurricane Center. Good morning, Andy. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and lastly, we have a special guest this morning, uh, Jeremy DeHart. Uh, Jeremy is, is one of the folks that fly into hurricanes. Uh, Jeremy works uh, in Biloxi, Mississippi with the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron out of the Air Force Reserve Hurricane Hunter Crew. Uh, Jeremy, uh, good morning. And I know you're going to talk a little bit about what you do, and then you're also going to be here for the question and answer. So I want folks to make sure they... Uh, uh, ask our, uh, our onboard uh, Hurricane Hunter pilot a lot of, or not pilot, but meteorologist, a lot of questions uh, today. So good morning, Jeremy. Good morning. Good to be with you all. Look forward to your questions. Thanks. Uh, and lastly, I will introduce John Candelosi because John's going to take it away from here with the first part of our presentation. Uh, John is also a hurricane specialist at the National Hurricane Center. So good mor morning, John, and I'll let you take it away. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, hopefully, everyone's having a good day, and hopefully, everyone's excited to learn about her because I'm really excited to teach. Her, so, is everyone else that's on the line. Now, I, before we talk about hurricanes, I have a question for you. 
Do you know what a meteorologist is? I'm sure many of you do, especially if you've been hit by bad weather recently. A meteorologist is someone who studies or forecasts the weather. And it could be someone who television telling you what the weather is going to be today or, or into the weekend. Or it could be people like us, forecasters as part of the National Hurricane Center, National Weather Service, or a hurricane hunter like Jeremy. The bottom line is, everyone, it's someone who studies or forecasts the weather. So if you're out there today and you like math and science and you have a fascination about the weather, you have what it takes to be a future meteorologist. So please keep that in mind if the interest is there. Now today we want to focus on telling you what we specifically do at the National Hurricane Center and in the National Weather Service. So greetings from Miami, Florida. That's where the National Hurricane Center is located. I wish I could be in the building today showing you around, but hopefully this gives you an idea. Now here's a look at what the building looks like from the outside. You can see these two pictures here. And when you look at the building, you'll say, well, it doesn't look that exciting, that pretty. And you'd be right, it isn't very pretty, but it is very, very strong. The building is made of concrete steel. And the reason it's designed that way is it's gonna be strong enough for us to stay working in that building, even if we get hit by a significant hurricane. Now, the National Hurricane Center has a big of everybody. Of course, we forecast tropical storms and hurricanes, but not just for the United States. We have a big, big area of responsibility. If there's a hurricane anywhere between Africa to all the way into the Pacific Ocean and pretty close to Hawaii, we're forecasting for those weather systems. In addition to forecasting hurricanes, we also are very much concerned for people who are out sea. We tell big ships, other people who spend time on the ocean what the weather is going to be like. So if you're on a cruise ship, or if you're going deep sea fishing, or if you know someone who rig, for example, we're going to give them weather forecasts how high the waves are going to be and how long the winds are going to be to so keep everybody safe out you know, over the oceans. I've also heard of National Weather Service. You might be thinking, well, where, where is that located? Well, the good news about that is the National Weather Service is essentially everywhere. I bet there's a National Weather Service forecast not far away from where you live. And there's actually 122 of these local weather forecast offices scattered across the United States. Now, as Dan mentioned just a little ago, we're lucky enough to have Daniel Manning with us today, who's from the National Weather Service Baton Rouge office. So, Danielle, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you guys do at that office? Sorry, I had to unmute my microphone. <laughs> um, no problem, Danielle. <laughs> so, um, our office is located in Slidell, but we forecast for all of southeast Louisiana and then southern and coastal Mississippi. So, if that's where you're from, you get your forecasts and warnings from our office. And um, so you, if you look at that picture in the top left corner, that's what our operations area looks like. And we'll typically have um, three or four people in the building during most uh, during most days. Right now, it's a little bit different since with a bunch of us working from home. But uh, one of the other things that we do to help support hurricane forecasting is um, in that top right corner, we launch weather balloons uh, at least twice a day. So during normal weather, during quiet weather, we'll launch a balloon twice a day and that helps the uh, forecast models get a handle on what's going on currently so that they can um, hopefully provide a better forecast you know, down the road. But during um, hurricanes, we'll actually launch them four times a day. So we'll do special balloon launches too. And uh, we work very closely with the Hurricane Center during tropical weather events uh, so that we can make sure that uh, we're taking that big, that big scale, big picture forecast that the Hurricane Center puts out and we take it and we localize it down to uh, what's going to happen right here in Southeast Louisiana and Southern Mississippi. So. Thank you, Danielle. Do you want to also talk about what happens in Felicia's office in Jackson, Mississippi? Sure. So, um, so as Dan mentioned, Felicia couldn't, couldn't join us because of the uh, tornadoes that happened yesterday. She's actually out looking at 
the tornado damage across the southern part of their forecast area today, so she couldn't join us. But um, we also work closely with the Jackson office during all kinds of weather events because they are our neighbors. So we have to make sure that our forecasts line up. And um, so Jackson, the Jackson office is responsible for forecasting for all of Northeast Louisiana, um, most of central Mississippi, and then also far Southeast Arkansas. So they actually cover parts of three different states. Um, but they, similar to us, issue forecasts all the time, 24 seven, they're in the office. And um, again, just like us, they also work closely with the Hurricane Center during tropical events um, to get the word out to all of those folks in central Mississippi and um, Northeast Louisiana, south, extreme Southeast Arkansas to make sure all those impacts are uh, well understood. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, we really appreciate that. And guys, if you have any questions about the local weather, if you live in Louisiana or Mississippi, where on the Gulf Coast, Danielle is your go-to person. So make sure to ask her in the Q&A section at the end. All right, everybody, let's talk specifically about hurricanes. And I want to describe some of the parts of a hurricane. Now, about, oh, I think I zoomed in here, guys. I apologize. When we talk about hurricanes, about that, when we talk about hurricanes, you probably know a little bit about their body parts. First, you know hurricanes get names, right? You might have heard of Hurricane Harvey or Rita that Dan talked about earlier. But do you know what these hurricanes look like and what moves them up? Let's look at this together. Look at the satellite animation. Hopefully, you kind of are impressed by it and hopefully something catches your eye. I bet it's this middle part right here. Am I right? That middle part is called the eye of the hurricane. And in some eyes of hurricanes, it can actually get sun completely calm. But it's weird calm, everybody, because the pressure's real low and it's so eerie. The reason it's eerie is right around the eye. And this area here is called the eye, where the winds are the strongest and the rain is often the heaviest. And unfortunately, where the damage tends to be the worst. Beyond the eye wall are the rain bands that are all spiraling around that center. Bands, the winds can be really gusty, and there could even be some tornadoes, which could, as you know, could be very damaging on their own. Now, I want to see if I can loop this for everybody. So here it is, because I want you to appreciate something. Take a large zoomed out look for me. You can almost imagine for a second that our hurricane's kind of beautiful, right? Mother Nature produces some beautiful and amazing things, but you definitely can't call hurricanes beautiful if one strikes your area because of how damaging they could be. Now, several years ago, several decades ago, everybody, we also found a way to group hurricanes and help communicate them about them. Now, you know hurricanes get names, but you might have also heard that they get a category attached to it, like Category 1 or Category 5 hurricane. How does that all work? Well, there were two men called Herb Saffer, who was an engineer, and Robert Simpson, who was a meteorologist that worked together to help design or build this. Now, when you see this scale, everybody, or when you hear about it during the hurricane season, please know this that the scale only tells you how strong the winds are. It doesn't tell you anything about rain or storm surge or everything else we're gonna talk about today. It's only about winds. Now, when you hear of a category one hurricane, it means the winds are in this range, 74 to 95 miles an hour. Hopefully you don't hear that we have a category five hurricane where the winds are so strong, 157 miles per hour or stronger. Now today, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about these major hurricanes. Now we call major hurricanes category threes, fours, and fives. Everyone, those are the most damaging hurricanes. Where do those major hurricanes typically go? Well, let's take a look together. Here's where we know where they go based on history all across the Atlantic Basin. Now each one of the lines you see on the screen indicate the path of a major hurricane. Where the lines turn is what I really want you to focus on, because that shows you where the major hurricanes were at when they're strongest. So let's take a look where everyone lives today. I know a lot of people who are listening to calling from the Gulf Coast region, and you can see a lot of yellow lines in that area, meaning that area has been affected by a lot of major hurricanes, but you're not alone. 
Florida, the Bahamas, a big chunk of the Caribbean region, and even up the U.S. East has seen a lot of hurricanes. And guess what? Even Canada has seen hurricanes out here in the eastern part of Canada. The bottom line, everybody, is hurricanes need warm water for their fuel. And if the waters near the coast where you live are warm, then guess what? You would definitely have a chance to see a hurricane and probably live in a spot that is pretty vulnerable to these hurricanes. Now, since most people listening to us today are from three states, I want to show you the hurricane history specifically those states. So let's start with Louisiana. The lines you see on the screen indicate all Louisiana landfalling hurricanes or ones that got really close to that, all the way back to the year 1900. Where the lines are red or the purpley color, it indicates where the storms are strongest. And where they change color to blue and green, it shows you where they're much weaker. Look at how many hurricanes have moved across Louisiana. Wow, lots and lots of hurricanes. So if you're listening to us today from areas like Lake Charles, over to New Orleans, or Baton Rouge, or Lafayette, you have seen some of the strongest hurricanes in Louisiana history. And if you're listening to us today for areas further north, like Shreveport or Monroe, you could still see some significant impacts from hurricanes, but they're certainly not as strong there as the impacts would be further south. But what about if you're listening to us from Mississippi? Well, it's the same kind of thing, right? Especially if you're listening to us from places like Gulfport or Biloxi, where they've seen really strong hurricanes. Everywhere in Mississippi can see the impacts from hurricanes. What about Alabama? Same thing. If you're listening to us from areas like Mobile or the southern Alabama, you have seen the strongest hurricanes in Alabama history. But again, if you're further north, like in Birmingham or even up to Huntsville, you could still see some significant hurricane impacts. All right, on to a quiz. Are you ready to test your hurricane knowledge? Let's see. Now this quiz question is going to be a poll. So once I finish reading the question, everybody, you're gonna see a pop-up appear on your screen. And what I want you to do is select what you think is the correct answer. Are you ready for your quiz? Here's the question. When Atlantic hurricane C, do you think the right answer is A, May through November, B, December through April, C, June through November, or do you think it's D, all year long? All right, everybody. I see is now open. Please vote what you think the right answer is, and good luck. John, I'm watching those uh, votes come in. I'll give you the results here in just a few more seconds. Okay, sounds good, Dan. Good response so far. Uh, almost 90% of everyone has voted. I'll give it just a couple more seconds before I close the poll. And I'll go ahead and uh, close the poll. I'll see if I can share those results. And uh, it looks like about 60%, John, said uh, June through November. Uh, another third said uh, May through November. Uh, again, uh, about 92% of the responses were one of those two answers. So I'll let you, I'll let you give the correct answer. All right. Well, I got good news for everybody. Well, we got a smart group on, on watching us today. The correct answer is the most popular one, June through November. Congratulations. That's 61% and did excellent way to go. You got the correct answer. But the other 30% or so, that was a really good answer too. May through November, we get so many storms that tend to happen in the month of May. Hopefully not this year, but really officially the season is June 1st to November 30th. But if you said May to November, that is really close. Now, hurricane season is half the year, June 1st to November 30th. And I want to show you how busy it can get during the peak of the hurricane season. The picture you see here is a satellite picture from space, which shows how busy the Atlantic Basin can get. In this picture here, you can see Hurricane Florence churning across the Western Atlantic, headed for the Carolina coast as a significant hurricane. This one here, the basin is Tropical Storm Isaac that was headed into the Caribbean Sea. 
This one over here in the Eastern Atlantic is Hurricane Helene. Curved out over the Eastern Atlantic, out ahead of that front you see there, but affected some of the islands here called the Azores Islands. And then we had another system forming off the coast of Africa that became Joyce, and yet another system here in the Gulf of Mexico that went on to, to affect Texas and Louisiana, but didn't quite become a tropical depression. I just want you to see that the hurricane forecasters at the Hurricane Center are always busy at that time of year, watching systems that affect the United States and others that either stay out to sea or affect other countries. Now you might say, well, okay, hurricane season's half the year, but when do we see the most hurricanes? Well, take a look at this campfire looking graphic with me and it'll help explain it. Whether you look at hurricanes by themselves, which is shown here in yellow, or hurricanes and tropical storms together shown in red, you get basically the same answer. Do you see that? That the peak in the season, or when we see the most hurricanes is right here, around September 10th. And the bottom line, everybody, is there's three months of the year that we want you to be the most ready, where the hurricane season is the busiest, the months of August, September, and October. So don't be too surprised if June and July are kind of quiet. That's not too unusual. It's usually the months of August, September, and October, really, really busy. All right, you ready for our next quiz? Let's see how you do this time. Now for them, we don't want you to vote. You won't see a poll open. We just want you to think about what the right answer is and then either say the answer out loud in your houses or just kind of say it quietly in your head. Are you ready? Here is the question. What primary hurricane hazards? Do you think the right answer is A, high winds, B, storm surge, C, heavy rainfall, D, dangerous surf along the beaches. What do you think the answer is E, all of the above? I'm going to give you just a couple of seconds to finalize your answers. All right, let's reveal it. The correct answer is E, all of the above. Congratulations if that's what you were thinking, because that is right. But if you didn't say E, don't worry about it. Every single one of these is not wrong. They're all significant hurricane hazards. And to help you remember these hazards, we came up with a word, a word that each letter has a different meaning called SWIFT. Hopefully you'll remember this. The S in the word SWIFT stands for storm surge. Now Andy's coming up after me and he's gonna tell you all about storm surge. But in a nutshell, storm surge is the ocean water that gets pushed to the land by the hurricane strong winds. And know this, storm surge can be a really big problem. The W in the word swift stands for what? Wind, of course. Everybody knows it's windy in hurricanes. I'm sure I didn't have to tell you that. The I in the F stands for inland flooding, the very heavy rains, which can be a huge deal, as many of you know. And the T stands for tornadoes, which is common in some of those hurricane rain bands far from the center. And as you also know, can cause some local significant damage. Now, another hazard we want you to remember that it's not in the word swift are the big waves and rip currents. Now, hurricanes produce huge waves. Sometimes the waves can be up to 50 feet high in hurricanes. And even if a hurricane doesn't affect your area, it doesn't mean you won't get big waves and rip currents. So we always want you to pay attention to people like Danielle and other local officials that will tell you it's a good idea to stay away from beaches. So please keep that in mind. All right, let's head to another hurricane. Now for this one, everyone, once I finish reading the question, you will have a chance to vote for what you think the right answer is. And I hope everybody does as well with this question as you do the last one. Here it is. Which hurricane hazard that we just talked about has caused the most deaths, unfortunately, in the United States? Do you think the right answer is A, wind, B, storm surge, C, flooding from the heavy rains, or D, tornadoes? All right, everybody, the polling is now open. Select what you think the correct answer is. And from here, Dan, I am gonna be passing the ball to Andy. 
Thanks, John. Appreciate you giving uh, that portion of the presentation and uh, had some had some good comments and thank yous on that. So that's great. Uh, watching the votes uh, come in here, it's uh, ooh, this one's really close, John. Okay. I'm gonna give it just a few more close. seconds because I still see some votes coming in. This one we had a little bigger response on this one. Over 90% of everyone has answered, so that's great. So about five more seconds. I'm going to close it, get those final votes in. Okay, I'm going to close the poll now, and I'll see if I can share those results. Um, the Just 36%, a, a little more than a third, said storm surge. Another 27% said flooding, and another 30% said tornado. So really close between storm surge, flooding, and tornadoes. So Andy, I'll pass it over to you for the answer. All right. Thanks, Dan. All right, can everybody see my screen now? Can you folks see me? We can, Andy, we can see and hear you great. All right. So the answer, uh, since 36% says storm surge, that was the highest value and that is the correct answer. The answer is storm surge. So when I was growing up, I lived a few miles inland from the coast on, in West Central Florida. Um, when I saw tropical storms and hurricanes move nearby, uh, wind is what I thought about. Uh, I would see the trees blowing in the air. I'd see uh, some palm fronds falling down. You see things on the news about debris, like you see in the top right-hand corner of the screen there. Um, that's what a lot of people think about, but water is really what people don't think about, but really should, because water is the most dangerous and deadly. Uh, in the hurricanes. So in the top left-hand corner, we see a lot of uh, standing water and flooding people being rescued. In the bottom left, we see storm surge. I'm going to go over both of those. There's a difference between the two. The top left is caused by heavy rain. The bottom left is actually caused by the ocean waters moving inland as a storm moves on shore. Water is what kills. So this pie chart, you look on the right and see storm surge accounts for almost half of the fatalities from a hurricane. Flooding from rainfall accounts for just over a quarter of them. And there's uh, two others on there. We see offshore and we see rip currents. Uh, those are also considered to be water-related fatalities, whether it be uh, from drowning or whatnot. So actually nine out of 10 people die from water, not from the wind. Here's a good example from Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy was a very large sprawling hurricane that made landfall in New England back in 2012. This is what Manhattan, typically looks like an East Village on any given day where there's people walking around, there's cars driving around. Um, I want you to note the, uh, the cafe over here in the, in the corner here with the white and then the red doors. Well, when Hurricane Sandy made landfall, the water from the ocean and the inlets came inland and flooded the area. You see the water up in this building is about a few feet up in the building. So this is likely trapped the folks that live in this part of the, the building here. And the van, the water is about halfway up the side of that van. So this water is at least a few feet deep in this area just from the surge. Uh, I described storm surge. I say water is very powerful and heavy when it's moving. Uh, if you were to be at the beach standing in the water and you get hit by a wave, that wave can knock you over. Well, that's what happens when these waters move on shore. They move on shore and have waves sometimes accompanied with it. These homes are closer to the beach. These homes are moved around by the waters. Uh, these, you see some houses up here have been drugged well off their foundations. So that's those, uh, those are photographic examples of storm surge. Now flooding rains can happen from hurricanes, they can happen from tropical storms. This, these photos I'm about to show you are actually from a tropical storm in 2001 in Houston, Texas. So what happens when you have these storms bring in very heavy rainfall, the tributaries, the streams, the ditches, the lakes can't handle all of the water coming in that quickly. And so the water finds somewhere else to go. In this example, you're looking at I-10, looking west in Houston. After Hurricane Allison made landfall and produced heavy rainfall over that area, the water flooded Interstate 10. You're looking at semi-tractors, water over halfway up the size of those tractors, several feet deep of water on the interstate corridor alone. Of course, tornadoes and water spouts can occur during a hurricane. 
And so the difference between the tornadoes and a water spout is that the water spout is over the water or tornado is over land. A water spout can become a tornado and vice versa if it moves from water to land. Like you see in this picture on the right, this water spout is moving inland and is becoming a tornado. Waves and rip currents, if you live on the, the, the ocean, if you go to the beach, that is a threat that can happen uh, even though the storm might be well out to sea, you might not ever see direct effects from the storm except for this, if the storm doesn't make landfall near your area. What happens is the large waves from the storm move in towards the coast, they splash onto the beaches, and the water from those waves has to go back out to the ocean afterwards. In the bottom left-hand corner here, you can see channels form in the sandbars, and those channels have very strong water currents that push out towards the open ocean. And if you get caught in one of those, you're being caught in a rip current. So the best rule of thumb for those is try to escape, as you see this graphic to the right, either to the side of that channel. Now, a lot of times the folks at the weather forecast office will show um, the rip current statements to tell you what kind of threat there could be from rip currents. Uh, and also, if you go to the beach, a lot of times they will have beach warning flags. If you see yellow or, or red, you really should probably be avoiding the waters. We talked about the hurricane hazards. Well, how do we predict them? How do we know how strong it's going to be? How do we know where they're going to go? Well, first off, we have a lot of different data that we're looking at um, in real time as it's sampling the storms. We have surface observations from land stations. We have ships out there that relay data, sometimes a cruise ship or a freight ship that's uh, within a few hundred miles of the storm might send data to us, and that'll be very helpful helping determine the, the intensity and location of it. Satellites, very valuable. In fact, we have new technology nowadays that satellites are even better than ever. The bottom left-hand corner, basically the satellites are in outer space taking photos from above and we can see what the storm looks like and we can determine how strong it is from those images as well. We have upper air data from around the country. The weather forecast offices will launch weather balloons and it'll help sample the atmosphere to try to determine what kind of environment the storm might be moving into and what might steer the storm in a certain direction. If the storm is close to the coast, you can have Doppler weather radar to sample the storm as well. Most of this data that we're collecting throughout the day is going into very sophisticated computer models that help simulate how strong the storm will become and where it will go. And our jobs as meteorologists is to try to determine how these computer models are, are behaving and help, help try to determine which simulation might be the best and most representative of what's going to happen. I'm going to turn it over here for a moment to Jeremy so he can discuss uh, for a moment or two about flying aircraft in the hurricane, which, which is one of the ways we sample these systems. Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, so hopefully you can see the, the pictures there. Um, so um, I am a meteorologist with the Air Force Hurricane Hunters. And uh, so the picture there at the bottom left of your screen is the plane that we fly. Uh, it's the WC-130. Um, you can see uh, the propellers on the side of the airplane. Um, that enables us to fly uh, very slowly into the hurricanes because there's a lot of turbulence, a lot of bumpy air. And so um, if you fly what uh, most people are used to, like a commercial, uh, commercial airplane, um, those fly a lot faster and you're going to feel a lot more of that turbulence. So it enables us to, to fly a lot slower. Um, the, the two planes right above are um, the NOAA Hurricane Hunters. Um, you can see the plane there in the top right is the P3. That's also a propeller plane. Uh, they fly right through the eye wall like we do. Um, and then the, uh, the G4 at the top left, they fly higher altitude. So they kind of fly more around the hurricane and drop what's called drop sons. Um, from the plane all the way down to the surface to kind of measure the, the outside of the storm. Um, and then uh, most of the, the pictures and video that people see of us are, uh, are similar to what you see there on the right. Um, so that's inside the eye where it's calm and clear blue sky usually, um, especially the stronger hurricanes. So we will fly right through the eye wall I uh, talked about earlier, so very turbulent, very bumpy, and then, um, but in the stronger hurricanes like that, category three or above, uh, it'll be clear and calm with sinking air, 
and um, absolutely beautiful. And uh, so what you're seeing there in that picture is what's called the stadium effect. And so if you can imagine yourself uh, standing in the middle of a football field, uh, like the 50 yard line, a big, um, and looking around, around you all the way around, 360 degrees around, um, you'd see uh, the seats going up from the field level all the way up around you. And that's exactly what it feels like in a strong hurricane like that. Um, and so it's those big thunderstorm tops all the way around and then the calm uh, inside the eyes. So it's just kind of a, a picture of what we get to, to see flying into these uh, strong storms. Thank you, Jeremy. So what happens during uh, storms approach inside the hurricane center? You're looking at an image on the left-hand side of inside the hurricane specialist unit uh, where they're actually doing on-camera interviews. A lot of the national TV media and folks, uh, radio, newspaper are all in there getting interviews. We get a lot of phone calls to do radio interview interviews and get information to, out to the newspapers, which then relay it out to you folks. And also we get on social media and send tweets and uh, Facebook posts as well. So getting ready for hurricanes coming up, we have Hurricane Preparedness Week 2020. That link at the bottom is a very useful resource. You go to this web page if you have questions about how do I prepare uh, developing an evacuation plan, what should I buy at the store to be able to get ready with my supplies. All this information is available on that link down below, weather.gov slash WRN slash hurricane dash preparedness. And that information will be available to you folks um, online now through the next couple of months. All right, so at this point in time, uh, for folks of you that have already been asking questions, we've probably been collecting some of those and you can keep asking the questions now. We're gonna be fielding some of those questions for everybody here uh, throughout the rest of the hour. Hey, thanks, Andy. Uh, yeah, so Dan and I have been watching the questions coming in. You guys have a lot of good questions that we wanna try and get to as many as we can. So the first one that caught my eye, and then Danielle, I'm gonna pass this one to you, is um, someone asked, why do you use balloons to measure the atmosphere? Because don't they pop when they go up in the sky? So uh, they do eventually pop, but on the way up to as high as they get, they collect a whole bunch of data um, throughout the entire atmosphere. So um, think of it like this. When we're observing the weather here on the ground, that's just one data point. But a lot of the weather actually happens above us. So we need to know what's going on throughout the atmosphere. And the best way for us to get that information is to attach a weather instrument to a weather balloon and send it up. And um, it actually goes up really high. It goes up about 100,000 feet before it pops. So we get a lot of information back from those balloons. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, I have one uh, for, for Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy, I know that you uh, flew into Hurricane Michael as it was making landfall. That must have been quite the experience. Uh, so Meredith asked the question, are you scared when you fly over uh, the eye wall? Sometimes. Uh, Hurricane Michael was a very good example because of how strong that storm was and how much turbulence that, that we saw. Um, Scared, I don't know if I would say scared is the word I would use. Anxious, definitely, um, especially when you know how important the mission is um, for those strong storms, especially as they're, they're getting ready to make landfall. Because what we do is the, the data that we collect from our plane, you know, Danielle talked about um, uh, the weather balloons that they send up so they can get, it's basically a weather instrument that they can measure the atmosphere um, that's what our plane is. It's a flying weather instrument. And so um, the data is very important that we collect to send to everyone you see on our panel here so that they can improve those computer models and um, send that out to the public. And so um, definitely when you've got a stronger storm like that that's getting ready to make landfall, um, the mission, the importance of the mission um, takes you know, precedent over every every other emotion that we're feeling. So um, usually I'm very busy uh, trying when we're flying through the eye wall. And so, um, yeah, it might be get bumpy, but um, I try to focus on just doing my job and, um, you know, making sure that I'm doing the best that I can. Uh, and, that, and so I'm just focusing on that. 
And then uh, real quick, why I've got the why I've got the audio here, I've got my my second graders here in the background itching to ask their questions. Um, so, Jack, you wanna you wanna come ask your question real quick? You can pop in here. What did you have? You had a good question about the eye wall. How big is the eye of the storm? How big is the eye of the storm? We get that question uh, quite a bit. It can be very small, um, as small as five miles sometimes. Uh, Hurricane Dorian last year was as wide as 40 miles. So it just depends on where the storm is and um, and where it is in its, uh, its cycle of getting stronger or getting weaker. Good question, bud. Thanks, Jeremy. I, I uh, you know, as a uh, forecast of the Hurricane Center, I always have to just say how much we thank you and all your uh, colleagues that uh, collect all that data because it's so helpful. I can't stress how much to folks out there that how much that data is useful in our forecasting. When we're looking at storms from satellite, it's kind of like taking maybe an you know a, a, an X-ray, but when you're actually flying in, it's like taking uh, you know a sample of what's going on. Uh, it can really help us out so much better because we're actually then measuring what those winds are in the storm. So uh, all of us, uh, you know, Robbie, Andy, uh, John, and I really appreciate all that all that you do and uh, your fellow crew members. Okay, so looking at other questions that we got here, John, I was going to pass this next one to you. Uh, Leah is asking, why do we give hurricanes names? And in addition to that, how do we come up with the names? Hey, Leah, really good question. So yeah, why do we give them names? You know, we, we didn't always give them names, but the reason we started doing that many decades ago is because we tried to help uh, people understand them and help communicate about them. You can imagine sometimes there's more than one hurricane out there, right? And it's how would you call them? Hurricane over here, hurricane over there. So we decided giving them names would really help reduce the amount of confusion. So that's really why we started giving them names. Now, how we come up with the names is another great question. So if you're interested, you can actually see what the names are for 2020, this hurricane season, all the way to 2026. So there's a running list. Every six years, the names repeat themselves. And you might notice if you look at the names that it's boy, girl, boy, girl, or the other way around. Some of the names are Spanish. Some of the names are French. Names are English uh, or other name or other type of ethnicities. And the only time the names really change, Leah, is if a hurricane produces so much damage, kind of like Hurricane we did, for example, or Hurricane Katrina. That Tired, we don't use it anymore, and we come up with a replacement name, uh, and that gets voted on through the World Meteorological Organizations. Great question, Leah, and we really appreciate that. Thanks, John. Uh, I have one here I'm going to turn over to uh, Danielle. That uh, since uh, you're at a local office and you uh, work with radars uh, even more so than we do, we're, we're of course looking at them as storms are making landfall, but you look at the radar every day. They ask, uh, how does the radar work? And that was a question from Davis. <laughs> um, okay, so what the radar does is it sends out energy waves. And I know that's kind of hard to, um, to kind of visualize since it's not something that we can see. But what it does is it rotates around 360 degrees. And as it does that, it sends out these energy waves and the energy bounces off of the raindrops or whatever's in the air and it comes back to the radar. And so that's what we see. We see the energy bouncing off of different things that are in the air, raindrops, hail, snow, all that stuff. And so, um, and so it bounces off and when it comes back to the radar, uh, the, um, the radar can tell all kinds of things. It can tell if the particle or whatever it is that the energy bounced off of, is it moving towards the radar or away from the radar? And that 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 information, that is it moving towards or away, is kind of how we try to find tornadoes. Because if something's moving towards the radar and then something right next to it is moving away from the radar, then we can we can infer a circulation. So, but it all comes down to uh, that radar um, dish sends out energy, it bounces off of the raindrops and everything else in the air, and then um, comes back to the radar for interpretation. Great, thanks, Danielle. I'm impressed with some of these questions. They're on a high <laughs> level. <laughs> uh, Jeremy, next question I, I saw was for you. Um, Seth is asking, are the airplanes that you guys fly made stronger than other planes? 
Um, that's a very good question, and the answer is not really. Um, if if you're familiar with a, a C-130 aircraft, there are different types of um, uh, configurations for that aircraft, and so we fly the WC-130J, and the W just means weather. It stands for weather. It just has our weather equipment on it, um, the the where we can release the drop signs and and gather the data. Um, but other than that, it's just like any C-130 aircraft, which are, they're already built very strong. Um, it's kind of like a, a tank, flying tank through the sky. So they're already made strong and they, they can uh, withstand the, the strong winds that we uh, deal with with hurricanes. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, I have a question. I was going to turn this one over to both uh, Andy and John. I figure they might both be able to uh, say a few words on this. Uh, but uh, Grace asks, uh, are all the swift hazards, are they always occurring in hurricanes? You know, we, we, we swift, again, the storm surge, wind, inland flooding, and tornadoes. But again, are those hazards always occurring in hurricanes? I can start off. Start? Go ahead, sure. Andy. Sure. I, I, if I get the question right, you're saying um, all those happen in all hurricanes? That, uh, I, I think, was what the question was uh, implying. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, that's not necessarily always the case. Uh, so a lot of the factors go into what kind of damage. I'll, I guess I'll address the uh, the S and W part. So the storm surge part. Um, if you have a let's say you have a hurricane that's moving into an area where there's a the slope of the continental shelf is a little bit different, uh, steeper. Um, you might not have as much surge. Or if the storm is uh, the wind field's very small, that'll have a lesser effect on the uh, high, how big of a storm surge you get. Uh, so you might have some surge, but not as bad as you might have in a different situation in a different location. Winds are pretty much in with every hurricane, of course, uh, and that, of course, would be dependent on how strong the storm is, but it also is a factor of the size. So if you have a very compact storm, a good example is Hurricane Charlie. I was in Tampa Bay area when Hurricane Charlie was supposed to make landfall as a Category 4 in Tampa. Uh, it deviated just a little bit to the right. And we had nice weather and 25 mile an hour winds that day. It was because it was a very small storm. If it was a much larger storm, we would have had much worse conditions there. So it's really dependent on the size and um, other factors like that. Okay, thanks, Andy. And I'll I'll add the other part that you uh, the I F and the T I suppose. So yeah, for the I F, the inland flooding, um, some hurricanes produce a ton of rain. Like that was the example for Hurricane Harvey a few years ago, where some areas got five feet of rain. And part of the reason it rained so much is it was moving so slowly in that case. But some hurricanes move really quickly and don't produce much rain. We've seen hurricanes that only produce a few inches of rain and some hurricanes that produce up to 60 inches of rain. So it changes a lot. And a lot of it depends upon not how strong the winds are, but how fast it's moving. And in regards to tornadoes, it varies too, everybody. This is a good question by Grace. Um, we've seen some hurricanes like Hurricane Ivan produce dozens of tornadoes all across the Eastern US and up in the middle of the US. And then some some hurricanes produce one or two tornadoes. So a lot of variability, a lot of things change. And that's why we always say each hurricane's a little different and we want to focus on these hazards and which one's going to be bad in this case and which one's going to be not as bad in some cases. So thanks for the question. Yeah, thanks, John. So Dan, I was going to throw one your way. Uh-huh, okay. okay. Uh, Tangerine is asking, what should you do to your house when you build a house near a beach in order to stay safe during a hurricane? Well, that's a, you know, that's a great question. I saw another question that was similar where it talked about, you know, how can we, can we prevent hurricanes? Well, we really can't prevent hurricanes, but we can do what's called uh, mitigation, or that's a big word, but it really means what can we do to our house to make it stronger uh, and better and, and what more well-built? So in some areas where they're uh, close to the beach and there's storm surge, some houses are built up on uh, on stilts so that the storm surge will then sweep uh, underneath the house and not necessarily through uh, the home. And then if you live in areas where you might experience a lot of strong winds, uh, we do things here in South Florida. My home uh, actually has what we call hurricane shutters or impact windows so that again, uh, we're trying to keep the wind into uh, out of from coming into the, the homes. And so here in South Florida, almost everyone uh, has either hurricane shutters or impact windows. And again, as a hurricane threatens and we start hearing the hurricane watches and warning, and that's when we have to 
either put up our shutters, get our supplies, and make sure uh, we are uh, well prepared. So again, for that house that's on the beach, hopefully they have hurricane shutters and hopefully it's built maybe above uh, what would be uh, the storm surge uh, height that would uh, typically occur. Hopefully I answered that one, uh, Robbie. Hey, yeah. uh, real quick, Dan and Robbie, um, yeah. on that, on about housing and hurricanes, my other son Grayson's sitting right over here and he had his question ready to go about housing. So Gray, you wanna come in and ask, ask your question? How strong does a hurricane have to be to uh, destroy a building? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Is anybody? I'm going to turn it over to some of my... I'll turn it back uh, to Robbie. He, he sent one my way. I'll send yeah. one to Robbie's way. <laughs> sure. So, you know, it all depends on the type of building that you're talking about. So some buildings, like John showed the picture of the Hurricane Center where we work, it's made of concrete. So we can actually withstand some really strong winds. So we don't really want those winds, but if we have to be in that building during a very strong hurricane, our building should be okay. Unfortunately, though, sometimes people live in homes that aren't very well built, and it doesn't take that strong of a wind to unfortunately cause damage. Uh, so unfortunately, we see some areas where there's mobile homes. Maybe that home isn't really tied down to the ground very well. And if the winds get even just to, you know, barely hurricane strength, which would be 74 miles per hour, uh, even those winds can cause damage to some people's houses. So um, it doesn't take a lot of wind in some cases. It all just depends on exactly how strong that building is built. Yeah, and uh, Jeremy, I have a couple questions that, that look like they're coming your way. Uh, Gabe asks, uh, what's the strongest hurricane you've flown? And then there's another question here. Not sure I can get the name on who asked it, but it was basically asking, um, did you, uh, did you, what, what was your training or college uh, experience uh, that you had to be able to fly into hurricanes? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a good question. If you think about most people are pretty familiar the last couple of years um, how active it has been in the tropics with hurricanes forming and um, so we've had there's been a lot of category five hurricanes that we've we've flown uh, as a unit over the last couple of years um, I flew in uh, Irma uh, a couple of years ago it was category five and um, I flew the landfall of Michael uh, a couple of years ago as well as category five I'd say Michael is probably the strongest um, because of how memorable it was for us because of how uh, how much turbulence we saw flying into it. Um, we dropped um, about 2,000 feet of altitude um, flying through the eye wall in our last our last pass. Um, so th that was uh, that was kind of a scary moment. So uh, I remember that one uh, very well. Um, to answer your question about um, the school that we had to go to, so. Um, Everyone here on the panel is a uh, is a degreed meteorologist, so we all um, at least um, have four year uh, degrees from a from a university. So in meteorology, um, so uh, that that's a minimum requirement. And then to do this job in the Air Force, you also have to do be commissioned as an officer into the Air Force. So I'm in a meteorologist, a weather officer in the Air Force. Um, so I did a uh, reserved officer training corps in uh, ROTC. I went to NC State University and uh, I got my degree through ROTC. So uh, it's a great question. Thanks, Jeremy. Do you have uh, do you have one ready, Robbie, or do you want me to uh, see if I can yeah. find another question? Yeah, I do here? have one. And I think I'm going to send this one to Danielle because uh, obviously the Gulf Coast has a lot of areas that are very swampy and Victoria actually asked how do swampy areas near the coast affect hurricanes or you flip it the other way around is what does a swampy area mean if a hurricane was to hit that type of land? Right so uh, that is a really good question and um, actually those swampy areas kind of help protect the areas that are farther inland from that swampy area. Um, it helps reduce the storm surge, it helps um, break the, the waves that are on top of the storm surge. So we really want to protect those coastal areas, those coastal marshlands and wetlands, um, barrier islands, all of those, um, all those areas uh, beyond where most people live. We want to make sure that we're protecting those because they help protect us from hurricanes too. Sure. 
Sure. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Daniel. I'm just kind of looking. There's so many questions. It's really hard to find uh, to to weed through all these to to see which one we want to answer. We, we're getting close to running out of time, but still have a few more minutes. Uh, let me see uh, which one. Uh, there's one question here. Maybe I'll throw this over to Andy. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it talks maybe a little bit about some of those ingredients we need for formation, but it says, can hurricanes happen when it's not hurricane season? Uh, I'll let you take that one, Andy. Uh, the answer is yes. They can happen when it's not hurricane season. Uh, we had a system develop last year, actually a subtropical storm that developed before the start of hurricane season, the official start. Uh, we've had other years where, um, I think if I recall correctly, the any given month of the year, there's actually been a storm. Uh, it just doesn't happen every year, uh, but you, you can get the right ingredients together during other months of the year um, in the right location where a storm can develop. You can get that disturbance moving over some warm waters. You can get uh, those calm upper level winds um, and those ingredients can all come together and a storm can definitely form during the off season. Okay, uh, thanks Andy. So. I'm trying to think of another question I found. There were a couple of questions about talking about storms around the world and why we call hurricanes hurricanes here in the US, whereas in some parts of the world we call them typhoons. Uh, so John, I was gonna pass that to you. Why is there a difference in what we call these storms? Yeah, so that's a great question, Robbie. So they first, I want to say that they really are all the same. You know, even though they you might hear different names like hurricanes, as Robbie said, is what we call them close to the U.S. They call them cyclones near Australia. They call them typhoons in the Western Pacific, like places near China and Japan. And they have all different kinds of names, right? First, you know that they're all the same. They're just the different names for sort of the same animal. And also know that they just get sort of regional names. You can imagine as you go across the country, sometimes you might call the same thing a different name. Like I'll call it a tractor trailer and you might call it a semi truck, things like that. But they're all some sort of the same weather phenomena that I'm sort of realized with different names and cultures. Thanks, John. Uh, I have a question here and I, I think I'll answer because I uh, uh, just looking at uh, some of the other comments, Lindsay, uh, you've uh, uh, ask if we could answer one of your questions and also uh, you mentioned earlier how much uh, fun you were having enjoying uh, our webinar so thank you uh, but you asked when did y'all start to name hurricanes and I don't think you covered that John when you answered the question uh, so it was really it was 1953 uh, when the World Meteorological Organization began deciding to name hurricanes so it's been done for uh, almost 70 years now that we've been naming hurricanes but again John talked about you know, how we name uh, the storms, where we get those names from. Uh, we have to see if Lindsay's on the hurricane name list, but I don't think it is at the moment, but uh, maybe if we ever have an L hurricane uh, retired, that would be a name that we might uh, consider. Uh, only a couple more minutes left. Uh, Robbie, I don't know if you have a final question or two that we want to uh, try to uh, get before we, uh, before we end this morning. Yeah, I was just gonna kind of have us all answer this question is, you know, we have a lot of kids on the webinar today, and I think a lot of them are really interested in weather. so. I'm just wondering, like, what's everybody's advice on if you want to get into meteorology and become a person that studies weather, what type pieces of advice would you have? And, you know, my first piece of advice would be just watch the weather. I mean, I think one cool thing to do is just watch the weather every day, even just write down what you see, and you really start to see patterns and how things behave, how the clouds move. And um, I know for most of us, when we were kids, we were always watching the weather. We look outside the window, we go outside and watch storms coming in. And I would say that if you're interested, just start doing that because that's the best way to really understand more about what's going on outside your windows. I know, John, if you want to take that next. Sure, I'll take it, Robbie. So in addition to watching the weather, which is my favorite, I think it's if you really know if you want to be involved, like be a meteorologist later, you could start to help yourself by getting good at a couple of subjects in school that is are really important. They're all important, but if you could start getting good in science and good in math, those two subjects, I think it's really going to help you not only get good at those subjects, but also get good at the background for meteorology. I'll tell you what, just about everybody on this panel is at one point in their lives are really good at math and science. So it will definitely help you um, succeed in school and then succeed to be a future meteorologist. So that would be my advice as well. Uh, I'll go next, John. Uh, so 
the idea that comes to mind is when you're going into uh, middle school and high school, there's always projects you have to do, or sometimes you have the option of what you want to do for those projects. Try working on a weather-related project. Do a little research project that has to do with the weather and see what you can come up with. So I'm going to add on to what John said. Another one of those skills that you could focus on is communication. Um, because I can tell you right now, the hardest part of my job is actually taking a very complex subject and communicating it in a way that everyone listening can understand. So um, working on those communication skills is also really important, whether you wanna go, um, pretty much any kind of meteor <laughs> meteorology job is gonna require good commu communication skills as well. So I'd, I'd recommend that. Danielle, you, you kind of stole my answer, but I'll go along with that. That uh, you know, one advice uh, to folk, you know, students out there is to really, uh, work on your communication skills. You know, I, I uh, didn't love to give presentations uh, when I was in uh, middle or high school. I, I did some uh, to get extra practice and start thinking about how to do that. Uh, but it really wasn't until I was an adult that I got more comfortable about uh, presenting in front of large crowds and folks. And it's so important no matter what job you do, whether it's a meteorologist, other science field, uh, or if you're in business, is to be able to talk about what you do, why it's important, and you really need to have that skill in life. So I would encourage uh, you to uh, practice those communication skills like Danielle uh, mentioned. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with all, all that everyone said. Um, I'd also add just learn what kind of um, opportunities there are out there in meteorology. Most people think, when they think meteorology, they think about television and, and sitting on the couch and watching the news and uh, having your television, local television meteorologist giving you a forecast, but I mean, none of us on the panel here today is in, in television. So um, there are a lot of different job opportunities, whether it be forecasting or, or um, computer, uh, getting good in uh, computer code and writing code. Uh, you'll, you'll learn as you, there's a big need for that. Um, and then what I do in the military, there's, there's um, weather forecasting jobs in the military. So just learn about um, all the different avenues you have um, potentially in meteorology and pick pick one that um, really interests you and uh, figure out what you need to what you need to do and the education you need to get there. Thanks Jeremy. Uh, I guess I'll start to wrap it up and see if anybody has anything else final to say in a second. Uh, I did want to mention we we did get uh, I did get a, a question here about uh, saying uh, will we do a, a webinar on tornadoes? Well I have to say uh, most of us here on this panel uh, are hurricane experts I'll certainly pass that along to the folks at the Storm Prediction Center as, uh, as something they want to do in the future. And I know if folks look at some of their local forecast offices, like where Danielle works, a lot of those offices are also providing uh, some educational activities through webinars and, and uh, you know, at home uh, while we're all going through the current uh, crisis. So uh, look for those as well from uh, other National Weather Service offices, but that's a great suggestion. And I also want to say thanks to everyone for all the very kind comments that people have been putting in our, even our question blocks. Uh, a lot of people saying how uh, much they enjoyed this this morning, and we really do appreciate that as well. So it looks like we've run out of time this morning. Uh, there is some additional information on some of those links that you see up on the screen. And then also we'll make this recording available on our uh, National Hurricane Center YouTube channel here in the next uh, few days. Uh, we had the webinars from last week already available. So if you want to go rewatch it or you want to share it with some friends of yours, uh, when you heard our, your question get answered, you can show it to them once we get that recording up. So uh, for now, I'm going to sign off and say uh, goodbye, everyone. Uh, others may want to say a quick uh, goodbye as well. But again, thank you so much for joining us and have a safe, uh, safe rest of your week. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.